First, a note uh, just to so you know that the, this meeting will be recorded and it will be posted to our to our YouTube channel. If you don't want your the image of you um, on that recording, then um, just uh, uh, just continue your your video feed. And even though your name appears like on our meeting now in the recording, it will not appear. So you'll be totally anonymous if you prefer to do so. Um, that reminds me, so we do have a YouTube channel. So the, shortly after this, probably within, within a day or so, the, the talk will be, will be posted on our YouTube channel. I've posted a link in the chat so you can visit that and the previous meetings that we've had recorded that we've done over, um, over Zoom are okay. posted there as well. Dave, I saw Dave. You did? Wait, not Dave, but Dan. I'll also ask again, if, if, uh, if you're not speaking, please mute your microphone. Thanks. Okay, so first order of business will, uh, if we have Gary Hebel, I think I see him out there. Yeah. Good evening, Gary. Hi. Um, he's our recording secretary. So uh, Gary, please go ahead and read the minutes of our, our last meeting. Okay. Can you hear me okay? I, we can. Okay. The 1219th regular meeting of the Entomological Society of Washington was started by President Jamie Zonizer at 7 p.m. on the 5th of March, 2021, in the form of a virtual gathering. 21 people joined the meeting. Recording Secretary Gary Hebel read the minutes of the February meeting, and these were approved by the attendees. Membership and Communication Secretary Elizabeth Young announced two new society members, Bradley Sinclair and Maria Julia Microsilva. President Zonizer presented the sad news of the recent passing of two society members, David Ruter and Chris Thompson. David was a specialist in water resources with special attention to caddis flies. Alan Norbaum commented that Chris Thompson served for decades with the Department of Agriculture as a specialist on flower flies, had great impact in the field of entomology, and initiated the development of databases and library resources. Program Chair Alan Norbaum introduced the speakers of the evening, Andrew Forbes and Elaine Hippie, both from the University of Iowa whose presentation was Lessons from Eight Years of Studying Sunflower Flies. Both ecology and taxonomy were studied relative to the tephridid fly genus Strausia, with attention given to coexistence of different species within a single host. The presenters admitted that they were not taxonomists and welcomed anyone willing to engage in such research in the genus Clausia. Thank you, Gary. Nice shirt, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Appropriate for this evening's talk. Uh, do we have any uh, additions or uh, changes uh, suggested for the for the minutes? Do we have uh, a motion to approve the minutes as read? So moved. Second. Okay, minutes are approved. Thanks, Gary. Hey. Okay, the next section would be uh, reports of officers and committees. Do any of our Entomological Society of Washington uh, officers have any anything to report? Okay, no problem. Um, we'll move on to the next section. Um, introduction of new members and visitors. Do we have Elizabeth Young out there? our membership Hello. secretary. Hey, Elizabeth. Hi. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, we have three new members this month. Excellent. We have Juana Maria Coronado Blanco and her student Ana Karen Serrano Dominguez, as well as Christopher Owen. Hey, how about it? <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Yeah. Good to hear. Thanks. And um, 
we, we probably also have a number of guests. If, if you're a guest and you would like to introduce yourself, uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and please do so. You don't have to though. Uh, hello, I'm Jason. I'm a student of Dr. Uh, Gruner, Dr. Daniel Gruner in his uh, ecology class, and he just invited us here to come watch this. And so I'm excited to learn more about cicadas. But yeah, undergrad. Um, yeah, okay. Okay, what, which school? Uh, University of Maryland. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Hey, I'm Josie. I'm also a student in the same class. <laughs> Excellent. Welcome. Hello, I'm um, 13 and I'm joining you from Northern Virginia, so definitely not an undergrad or a grad student, but I'm excited to be here and uh, see what it's all about. Great. Welcome to everybody's um, visiting. That's, this should be a wonderful talk. Thank you so much for coming. And I wanted to welcome anyone from Troop 255 who made it. I think I might see a few who, who joined, so welcome. <laughs> okay, uh, on to the next section. It's just uh, 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 unfinished business. And so at this, at this section, I usually just announce that if um, if you're a previous member and haven't renewed, please go ahead and renew. If you'd like to, if, if you're um, not a member and would like to, I've posted a link to our member page and you can, um, you can join the society if you'd like. If it's regular membership is $30 and that includes, it's $30 for a year and that includes a um, access to our, our journal, the Proceedings of the Entomological Society of Washington, which is uh, published four times a year. So re that's regular membership at $30. Student membership is just $15, which also includes uh, access to the, to the proceedings. And uh, membership also includes free page charges. So if, you, if you're interested in publishing in uh, the proceedings, uh, there are free, free page charges, including uh, up to two free color plates per, per publication. And if you want to pay more for the, the print edition of, of the proceedings, that's an extra $30. But um, like I said, regular membership is $30, student membership $15. Um, okay, and so that's, that's it for unfinished business. Um, new business, the, the next meeting uh, will be in uh, a little, uh, in a month from now on Thursday, May 6th. Uh, again, at 7 p.m., the speaker will be Dr. Mark Branham from the University of Florida, and the title of his talk will be The Evolution of Bio Bioluminescent Signals and Fireflies. So also sounds like it'll be an interesting talk. Okay, the next section of our meeting is the uh, presentation of notes and exhibition of specimens, so sort of our show and tell section. Does anybody have any specimens or uh, anything of interest to, to show for, for, for tonight? Hey, Jamie, I might give people a little better picture image of the shirt I'm wearing. Yeah, great. By rising. It says, I was there at Brood 10, 2004. Obviously, a 17 year old shirt. Awesome. It's a nice looking shirt. Yeah. <laughs> and our speaker also shared this shirt. She had the same shirt. Um, cool. There we go. This shirt also, Dave. Yeah, I have one that uh, is from 17 years ago also. Good. Good. All right. Everybody's getting in the spirit. Excellent. Okay, any other any other specimens or things to show? Okay, we'll move on with the um, with our speaker for tonight. I'll, I'll note now um, that if you have questions, 
for this speaker, please type them in, into the chat. And uh, after the talk, we, we'll, we'll get to all the questions. And tonight we have a special uh, announcer of our speaker and apparently new member, Chris, uh, Chris Owen, will, will, uh, who was a student of our speaker tonight, uh, will, will introduce our speaker. So Chris. Good evening, everybody. Um, tonight, I'm proud to introduce my PhD advisor or former PhD advisor, Chris Simon. Um, so I just thought I'd introduce, go through her CV and tell everyone a little bit about her and her background. So um, Chris received her PhD from Stony Brook University uh, or University of New York at Stony Brook. Um, she received her bachelor's and her master's from the University of Florida. Uh, she studied, I should say, for her PhD, she studied uh, magic cicada, while for her master's, she worked on intertidal barnacles. Um, so prior to her current position of professor at University of Connecticut, um, she did a postdoc at the University of Chicago, and then one at um, what was it? Uh, Washington University at St. Louis with Alan Templeton, famous population. <laughs> Um, and then prior to going to Connecticut, she took a position at the University of Hawaii. Why she left Hawaii, I'm not sure, but uh, <laughs> after Hawaii, she finally moved to uh, Connecticut. Um, she's received uh, or she's had numerous uh, short term and joint appointments. Um, one notable is one at Victoria University in Wellington, uh, New Zealand where um, she resides part of the year with her husband, Steve. Um, the main background of her, of her research is cicadas, uh, and she uses that as a system to test uh, historical biogeographical bio questions, um, trait evolution, uh, <coughs> molecular evolution, Etc. Uh, that being said, when I was in her lab, many different students worked on different organisms. So there was people in there working on beetles, leps, um, parasites, intestinal parasites of sharks. So a broad diversity of topics that went through her lab or research projects that went through her lab. Um, outside of the university, she's active in societies. Um, the most notable, probably the systematic uh, or the Society of Systematic Biologists. Um, she was president, um, but she was also the editor. And it's probably important to note that while she was editor, uh, the impact factor went from about seven to over 10, which is quite impressive. Um, and she's received numerous grants on cicadas, uh, some of which I've worked on. Um, and currently, I don't know if she's still working on it, but the endosymbionts of cicadas now. Yeah, I see she's shaking of her head. <laughs> um, so that's just a brief summary of her research, but I should say to the students out there that she's a tremendous advisor and I highly recommend her, whether you want to be an undergraduate student of hers or a graduate student of hers. Um, I don't think you'll get a, or have a better mentor. Um, so without a further ado, I uh, give it to Chris on it. Great, thanks a lot, Chris. Um, I'll start sharing my screen. And um, those of you who haven't muted your computers, you might want to mute the no. microphone. Okay, so thanks again to Chris for introducing me, very kind introduction, and to Alan for the invitation. So today I'm going to talk about 13 and 17 year cicadas, insects that count <laughs> in fours. So um, I'm going to start my talk with the outline and then a brief um, introduction uh, talking about why study cicadas in the first place in general, then periodical insects, um, and then a brief introduction to the magic cicada life history, talking then about the bruising species, 
citizen science, and it's used in use in magis cicada research, counting in fours, and the evolution of periodical cicadas. So um, over, I've been working on magis cicada since I was a student, and so almost 40 years. And, um, but I've had a lot of great collaborators along the way, including long-term collaborators, John Cooley, Kathy Hill, David Marshall, Jean Kritsky. And um, Chris hasn't worked on Magiscata before, but he's gonna join us soon on Magiscata genomics. And a number of collaborators in Japan led by Teiji Sota and Jin Yoshimura and um, many others and many students and postdocs who are listed here. Our funding has come from the University of Connecticut, but mostly from the National Science Foundation. And our Japanese collaborators have gotten their funding from the Japan Ministry of Education, Science and Technology. So why study cicadas? I could think of 10 good reasons. I could think of more, but here's 10 good reasons. One, they're good for studies of speciation. So when I was a um, undergraduate, I got interested in the question of why are there so many species um, and how do species form and what is a species? And when I went to do my PhD, I decided that um, if I was gonna study speciation, I needed to find an organism that was in the early stages of speciation. So I had read about the periodical cicadas and I knew that they had these year classes known as broods. And so in the picture, you can see six of the 12, 17 year cicada broods. So in um, every year there would be, or almost every year, cicadas coming out in a different part of the Eastern United States. And these, um, the adults in one year never saw the adults in another year. So they were reproductively isolated. So this could be a model for speciation. And these, if they stay reproductively isolated for a very long time would become new species. Two, cicadas are diverse worldwide. They have interesting morphology and natural history. There's about 55 tribes, still, we're still revising them, more than 450 genera and about 3000 species estimated worldwide. Some are cryptic and blend in with green foliage or dead leaves. Others are as colorful as butterflies. In this paper that's in press in Invertebrate Systematics, um, led by Dave Marshall and Kathy Hill, we found that the colorful wings and opaque wings had evolved uh, at least five times in the um, Indo-Asian cicadas. Still others are aposematic in coloration, that is warning coloration, and they have a noxious smell. So I assume that they're not good to eat. Some are even nocturnal. On the lower left, Frogatoides from Australia. And on the lower right is an unusual cicada. It's actually in a different family of cicadas. There's two families of cicadas. The hairy cicadas were most abundant during the Mesozoic, the time of dinosaurs. And today there's only two species left and they're both found in Australia, one in Tasmania and one in New South Wales. They fly in the coldest part of the summer and they even shiver to generate heat. And so here we are black lighting at about 55 degrees Fahrenheit or 12 centigrade. Three, they have economic importance. Um, their wings have these little micro pillars, different species of cicadas have different pillar shapes. And these have been used in nanolithography um, for the macro um, fabrication of light scattering, antibacterial and water repellent fabrics. If you do a Google search on cicada plus wings um, for Google Scholar for published papers, scientific papers, you find um, 15,800 papers and most of those are within the last five or 10 years. They have economic importance also in terms of oviposition over damage. They lay eggs in um, fruit trees, in, in grapevines. There's some that specialize on sugarcane. And there's even cicadas in Japan, uh, like this Cryptotympana fascialis, that lay eggs in fiber optic cables. In fact, in 2007, more than 1,000 cables were cut by cicadas. And the company had to redesign the cables to make them less attractive to cicadas. They're also economically important in terms of the noise they make. 
Many um, graduation ceremonies, golf tournaments, weddings have been disrupted by the loud cicada noise. Here you can see um, a picture of Bob Dylan when he was very young. He earned an honorary degree at Princeton University in 1970, but the ceremony was drowned out by the periodical cicadas. This is Brood 10. And he was so impressed that he went home and wrote a song called The Day of the Locust. In New Zealand, there was a murder investigation that was disturbed by noisy cicadas and they had to call the fire brigade who had to douse the cicadas about every 20 minutes to keep them quiet. Um, and you can have a very memorable wedding by scheduling it during a periodical cicada emergence. Four, cicadas are so cool that other insects try to imitate them. Here is a heteropteran bug trying to look like a cicada. This is from Belize. There's also, this is one of the most weird cicadas, a hammer-headed cicada. It was first published in 2013. It was discovered in Thailand by Michel Boulard and Stéphane Poussant. And as you can see, there's other animals that attempt to mimic it, like the stalk-eyed flies or the hammer-headed shark. Five, cicadas are much loved cultural icons in Asia. These are jade cicadas that are carved and put in the mouths of dead people to carry their spirits into the next world. Cicadas are symbols of health, wealth, and happiness. New Zealand, there's a town named Kihi, which is Maori for cicada, and there's a cicada motel in that town, and there's a statue of a cicada in the town green. In France, the district of Provence has chosen cicadas as their symbol because of the the singing every summer in the olive trees. And worldwide, cicadas are a favorite cultural icon. In China, they make hairy monkeys out of cicada shells or um, alien creatures. And these are more modern um, alien creatures made out of the cicada shells. There's Pokemon cicadas, three different ones, Halloween costumes, transformers, uh, and music that is either about cicadas or has cicada songs in it. Six, they're a source of inspiration for artists. These are just a tiny fraction of my collection of cicada art. Seven, the study of cicadas incorporates in exciting elements of danger and glamour. Cameron Diaz was attacked by cicadas in the Honduran rainforest. I doubt it, really. Um, and Cicadas were used in an alleged robbery in Cincinnati where two men armed with a cicada apparently stole $25 from a restaurant's cash register after using the six-legged bug to scare away the cashier. Eight, they're good to eat. Restaurants all over the world feature cicadas in their menu and in the United, Eastern United States once every 17 years, like this ice cream shop in Columbia, Missouri in 2011, um, that's a really well-known ice cream shop. One of my students said, I've been there. And, um, but in 2011, they ran out of cicada ice cream and left the sign saying, check back in 2024. Nine, cicadas will tell you what species they are and they'll come when you call them. This is very convenient for doing research. And so here is my former master's student, Dan Vanderpool, and he's got this little cicada on his shirt and he's clicking to the cicada because the females click their, flick their wings to call in the males. And so he's clicking with his tongue. And so the cicada is going in towards, towards his tongue. And the cicada is making a sound something like this. And after every click of the male cicada, the female is clicking her wings like, And then the male will, is climbing towards Dan's mouth, trying to find the female. 10, cicadas are magic. And in fact, the genus Magis cicada was, uh, was named Magis cicada by W.T. Davis in 1925 because he thought they were magic. Part two, periodical insects. More than 50 species of periodical insects occur in the world. There's more than 38 species of Lepidoptera, more than four, be four beetles, at least one fly and one hymenopteran, 
more than 10 hemiptera, including the pine bark bug and three different genera or nine and nine species of periodical cicadas. Periodical cicadas are known to occur in just three places in the world. We used to think that magic cicada was the only periodical cicada, but in recent years, there's been a periodical cicada identified in Fiji um, by in the literature, but the natives of Fiji have known about them um, forever. And um, it's an eight year cicada, it's called the Nanai um, and Oriateyana nolsai. And um, in Northeast India, there's a cicada called Nyangtasar, and it's um, a four year cicada, it comes out once every four years, right before the World Cup. So they call it the World Cup cicada, mm. from Mystica Rapoi. <clears throat> and in the Eastern United States, we have 13 and 17 year periodical cicadas in the genus Magis cicada, and there's seven species. The, the Nanai are really beautiful. Here's a, some pictures of, of some from Fiji from the 2009 emergence. And here's the um, Nyang Tasser in um, Northeast India and uh, the person who first published on them, Sutana Hajang. And every year there's a festival, uh, every four, once every four years, um, to celebrate the emergence and the local, local people have a special dance and they have these, these long um, bamboo um, containers which they use to collect the cicadas and then those sticks which they mash the cicadas down into the, the container and then they eat them. And similarly in Fiji, people um, wait for the cicadas to come out. They use them for um, gifts and they also eat them. They, they make them into necklaces as well as wedding presents. Part three, Magic Cicada Life History. Cica uh, periodical cicadas in the Eastern United States emerge in plague proportions once every 13 and 17 years. When the pilgrims uh, landed in, in um, Plymouth and established a colony there, they had a really hard time for um, the first few years. And shortly after they arrived, there was a, a big mass emergence of periodical cicadas, and they thought it was a biblical plague of locusts. Um, and so from then on, uh, cicadas in North America have been called locusts. But of course, most of you know that locusts are grasshoppers, not cicadas, and that cicadas don't fly in swarms. They don't eat crops, and, um, and they're not grasshoppers. They're plant-sucking bugs. Their strategy for survival is safety in numbers, which is also called predator satiation. They emerge in the evening and um, they'll either come out of these little mud turrets or they just come out of holes in the ground. They head for the nearest vertical object, which they climb. This could be a tree, but it also could be the side of the house, bushes, um, car tires, whatever is around and they'll split their skin down the back, lean out backwards, and then begin to pump their wings full of hemolymph to straighten them out. Eventually, after about an hour, the wings are completely flat, and then they'll fold them down along their sides, roof-like. And then by morning, they'll turn black. Um, they'll be black with orange wing veins and, and red eyes, although there is some variation in eye color. And, um, if the emergence is really heavy, you'll see, you could still see them coming out in, in the daytime, but it's, it's unusual for that to happen. So during the first week of the emergence, the males begin to emerge first, um, then the emergence um, becomes sort of equal sex ratio and near the end of the emergence it's mostly females and they'll usually emerge over about a, a five day period um, in the warmest areas first. And um, then the males will start singing after, but not for about four or five days because they still need to harden the chitin in, inside. And um, then after about five to nine days, they'll start mating and uh, the males will establish chorus trees. The females will come in to, um, to where they're chorusing and then start flicking their wings and then the males will come up to the females. And then um, the um, third and fourth weeks of the emergence will be mostly egg laying and the males will start dying before the females. 
The eggs are laid in twigs in tree branches, generally pencil sized branches for the um, pencil sized branches and each female will lay 400 to 600 eggs. Um, the after the eggs hatch the nymphs will launch themselves from the branches to the ground and then burrow down in and pass through five stages, each time shedding their skin to become larger. And the fifth stage, the fifth instar, um, will shed its skin after it comes out of the ground. Part four, magic cicada broods and species. Here's a white-eyed cicada, photo by John Cooley. Um, sometimes they're white or bluish or bluish gray. Um, and occasionally you'll see salmon, dark red, bright red but most of them are red, orange, dark, or bright red. So periodic cicadas are divided into these broods or year classes, which I mentioned before. Some are very small, like brood seven in upstate New York here. Um, and some are much larger, like brood 10, which is gonna come out this year in the Eastern United States. The 17 year cicadas are numbered one through 17, although not uh, all 17 years are occupied. Brood 12 has never been done, and neither has brood 16 or 17. The 13 year cicadas are divided into, um, could have 13 possible years during which they come, could come out, but we only know of three well established 13 year cicada broods. And these are numbered 18 through 30. The broods numbered one and 18 were chosen arbitrarily in 1893. Um, by Charles Marlatt. And so, um, as you can see, um, they're, they're distributed in different parts of the Eastern United States, but some of them overlap um, sort of like a mosaic, like 10 and 14 um, have uh, widely overlapping distributions, but, it, but usually not in exactly the same forest. The broods fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. And um, so this is a, a map that's made of all of our records um, from our Magiscata database put together by John Cooley. And um, you can see these maps on uh, the website, cicadas.yukon.edu. So periodical cicadas exist as three morphologically different forms. Um, you could think of them as large, medium, and small. The large pair is the decim pair. They're more most common on the eastern United States, um, and um, they have this sort of orange color on the abdomen. The Cassini pair um, is most common in the Mississippi Valley region, but they really occur. These co-occur throughout the ranges of almost all the broods. Um, Cast and I are black underneath, and Decula is the smallest one. It's um, black with orange stripes, really narrow, sharp orange stripes. But the biggest difference is the song. It's, they're very different from one species to the next. This is the song of the decim group. And when they're singing all together, it sounds sort of like flying saucers landing um, or very quiet machinery in the distance. But the Cass and I have a very harsh call. It's like clicking and then scream at the end. And when a whole bunch of them are singing together, it sounds like somebody took water and threw it into hot fat. And Decula, it has a more mellow song. Um, it's sort of like a little tambourine and they get into this pulsy, sort of sounds like an angry squirrel. And um, so, each of these species groups has a 13 and a 17 year representative. And so um, these cicadas are, um, they occur in both the 17 year cicadas, which are more Northern and the 13 year cicadas, which are more Southern and occupy the Northern Mississippi Valley as well. If you notice the 17 year cicadas have a hole in the distribution, which are filled by these Northern 13 year cicadas in Missouri and Southern Illinois. The um, six species of periodical cicadas were described together in a monograph by Alexander and Moore in 1962. This was the first time that the um, Decula group was described. 
And um, so he named the 13 years Magisticata tridecula and the 17 years Magisticata septendecula. In the Cassini group, um, M. Cassini was already named and it doesn't have this septen in the beginning because it was named before this naming system was established. Um, but they did name Tradecassini to go with it as a pair. And in the decim group, um, septendecim and tradecim were already named. Then in 1988, my student Andrew Martin and I discovered a new species of periodical cicada, a new 13 year cicada, which um, was later named Magis cicada neotradecim by Marshall and Cooley in 2000, who were studying the acoustic behavior of these cicadas. We did, when we looked at the cicadas, well, this was the first time that DNA data was going to be applied to cicadas. And we discovered this Magis cicada neotradesum or new 13 year cicada right in that hole in the distribution of 17 year cicadas in Missouri and Southern Illinois. We, um, we set out to compare them to the largest brood of 17 year cicadas, brood 10, and um, these belong to the 13s belong to brood 19, which occupies Mississippi Valley and all across the eastern US. But we noticed that when we were collecting them, the northern uh, 13 year cicadas had black stripes on their abdomen, similar to 17 year cicadas. And the southern 13 year cicadas had entirely orange abdomens, just as Alexander and Moore had described. Then when we looked at their DNA, we found that the DNA was identical, mitochondrial DNA was identical to 17 year cicadas and different from 13 year cicadas. And we compared, um, we, we scored abdominal colors um, using a, 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 a scorecard with four different states on it. And we did this blind. And when we did that, we found um, the in the map the low yeah. numbers make uh, indicate black abdomen. Yeah, she said the thing came through for the uh, high and school reunion. I the high numbers indicate orange abdomens, and um, then there was a sharp dividing line between them. And so individuals with um, different color abdomens had different color, different DNA. So in fact, these uh, thirteen years cicadas looked exactly like seventeen years cicadas. And so we suspected that these were 13 year cicadas that had recently formed from 17 year cicadas by permanently switching their life cycle to 13 years and joining a pre existing 13 year cicada brood. And this has since been confirmed by other data. Now, citizen scientists in part five here have played a big role in helping us to understand the evolution of periodical cicadas especially in recent years. Um, Dan Mosguy, who established the website Cicada Mania back in the year 2000, um, has been an, an excellent help in spreading the word about all kinds of cicadas um, and helps us with our public outreach. And he's especially interested in the periodical cicadas. Um, there's also the website that was created by John Cooley called magiscata.org. And he established this in 2018 um, when he was working in my lab. And um, in th this website allowed people for the first time to um, fill in a web form and report an emergence. And when they, when they reported on the web form, they had to type in the latitude and longitude of the cicadas they saw. And um, then uh, that data was plotted on a map. And so they could look at the map and follow um, all the reports. And then on this uh, second map here down at the bottom, there, were, there was, if people clicked on that, they could see a map of experts um, mapping the edge of the distribution and checking out some of the odd localities. And um, the experts worked with automatic data loggers, which we still do. So this gave us a new window into the extent of straggling or cicadas coming out in odd years. So this is a page from magiscata.org on the 26th of May, 2015, when brood 23 was coming out in the Mississippi Valley. 
and brood four along the eastern edge of the Great Plains. So brood 23 is a 13 year brood and brood four was a 17 year brood. But we also got records here of brood uh, 19 in Tennessee coming out four years late in Nashville because Nashville's a big brood 19 area. Then we got records in Pennsylvania of brood eight coming out four years early. And then also in here in West Virginia and Ohio, we got um, some records of brood five coming out one year early. And the other nice thing about the magiscated.org is it was plotted on Google Earth. So you could zoom in on the map and you could see exactly what street the record came from. So we could go in and do our mapping using this as a guide. Now, in uh, 2019 and 2020, we had a big advance um, from our long-term collaborator, Gene Kritsky, who um, developed a cell phone app for periodical cicadas. And this was an advance because people did no longer had to type in the latitude and longitude, but they could just take a photograph of the cicadas using their cell phone with the GPS turned on. The photographs are automatically sent by the app to um, the College of Mount St. Joseph or University of Mount St. Joseph, where uh, Gene is based. And then he has a whole team of students checking the photographs to make sure that they really are periodical cicadas. Then he plots the data on a map or his IT people plot the data on a map. And they also send the data to, um, to John Cooley at cicadas.ucon.edu. Um, he's recently migrated magiscicada.org to this new location, cicadas.ucon.edu, which is also filled, in addition to maps, um, lots of other information about periodical cicadas. So last year in 2020, we got some really excellent information using the Cicada Safari app. So last year was Brood 9, which is inside this gold circle here. And, um, but in addition to getting lots of records of brood nine, we also got um, a whole bunch of records of brood 19 coming out four years early. So these were nine year cicadas. Now we suspect that they weren't out for very long and they weren't coursing and they weren't laying eggs because we didn't get any reports later in the season. However, in Chicago, we got lots of records of brood 13 coming out four years early, and they were out for the entire emergence, so four weeks. They were singing loudly and they were laying eggs. Now, this is important because back in 1969 was the first time that it was recorded in scientific literature that cicadas came out four years early in the Chicago suburbs. Um, and it was, again, it was brood 13. Um, by Divis and Lloyd, but they reported that the cicadas did not sing and they did not lay eggs. So we think that now with the gradual warming trend due to climate change, that these cicada um, four-year early emergences are going to be happening more and more and maybe even lead to the establishment of new broods. We also got records of brood five four years late, um, but very few. Um, because four-year early emergences in the warming trend tend to outnumber the four years late. And then we also always like one year before an emergence, we always get a few records. So we get a few records of brood 10 in Knoxville, a few in, um, in, in Indianapolis and Cincinnati area, and then um, a bunch in Washington, DC, Baltimore. But these cicadas one year early, don't really uh, stay out for very long. But if anybody saw any last year that stayed out for a long time and formed choruses, please let us know. However, you may remember that in 2017 in the Washington DC Baltimore area, there was a massive emergence of brood 10 four years early. And um, these were mapped by um, the magiscated.org site. And we gave the data to a Yukon student, um, Aaron Kane, who was in media studies. And he created this little GIF showing the emergences as they uh, reports, as they piled up from April 29th to June 2nd. We also went down to DC and um, my husband and I mapped the area just to the um, west of DC out to Herndon and then to the Potomac. 
and it sounded to us just like a normal emergence. However, we dug in the ground um, in some of the suburbs and we found twice as many cicadas still underground. So you don't have to worry, you'll have still lots of cicadas coming out this year. <clears throat> Part six, counting in fours. What is the significance of four years? Four years is the difference between 13 and 17 year cicadas. Four years is also the difference between the largest broods of 17 year cicadas. It's the difference between the largest brood of 13 year cicadas. And um, it's the average length of each juvenile instar or stage, not counting the first. It's also the time we see late and early stragglers, four years um, early and four years late. Why four years? We think that it's tied to the evolution of long life cycle um, and uh, of periodical cicadas um, from non-synchronized annual cicadas with variable growth rates. Now, annual cicadas don't, uh, they come out every year, but they don't have a one-year life cycle. There's only, of the 3,000 species worldwide, there's only about 38 for which we know the life cycle, but the majority of them have a three to five year life cycle with the offspring of any one female coming out over um, a three year period. And so some might come out over uh, after three years, most of them after four years and some more after five years. And so the, the nymphs underground have variable growth rates and that leads to them coming out in different years. So how did periodical cicadas become periodical or synchronized with none in between? So there's two ways to evolve synchrony. The first would be to synchronize all of the nymphal growth and molting. The second would be to add a waiting period at the end so that the nymphs reaching the fifth instar first can wait for the others to catch up. Now they won't necessarily stop growing, but they won't go out, they won't emerge from the ground. They'll wait for um, the rest of them to catch up. And in fact, the second, uh, the second number is what happens because apparently periodical cicadas have not been able to overcome the fact that nymphs grow at different rates underground. So um, non-synchronous growth and molting was shown um, by Joanne White and Monty Lloyd first in 1975. In a single population, they found that nymphs grow at different rates. They dug up nymphs that were nine years old and they would find a mixture of thir third, fourth, and fifth instars. Um, so some of the nymphs were going slow, some of them were growing fast. And this was confirmed by Chris Meyer from the uh, Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station who dug up um, 100 nymphs a year for 17 years in a row and found that the same thing was going on. They were growing at all different rates. Um, White and Lloyd found that magicated nymphs in the south were growing faster than nymphs in the north of the same life cycle. Um, and that um, in the south, they would have a longer growing season and um, that would due to environmental differences between north and south. And that's why 13 year cicadas are found in the South. Uh, they found that 13 year cicadas grow faster than 17 year cicadas, even under similar growing conditions. So, where 13 year cicadas are living near 17 year cicadas at the same latitude, the 13s are still growing faster than 17s, um, even though you know, the 17s could have this waiting period at the end. And so that's a kind of a gen genetic constraint where the 13 year cicadas are genetically different from 17 year cicadas. So why do nymphs grow at different rates? Well, first there's genetic variation. You have differences in vigor among different nymph genotypes. Some will just be healthier than others. Two, you have environmental variation. You have variation among localities where in the South there's longer growing seasons and maybe up along the Northern Mississippi Valley. And in the north, there's shorter growing seasons. Um, also, if you have differences in rainfall, that could cause differences in growth rate. Within localities, you can even have differences in the environment. So you can have um, nymphs on different positions on the roots. Um, some, some of them may have a better feeding position than others. 
Um, but some might be on different plant host species because the roots of different plants are mixed together underground and they're feeding on deciduous roots and they're generalists. <clears throat> and there's also patchy nutrients available to plants. And so um, everything basically in ecosystems is patchy. So it's not surprising that there's variation in growth rate from place to place within a population. And then also different nymphs could have different endosymbiont qualities. So the periodical cicada, well, all cicadas feed on xylem. And so that's a nutrient poor resource. And in order to get their essential amino acids and vitamins, they have to have um, endosymbiont bacteria that make those things for them. So um, when we think about the evolution of periodicity um, from an annual cicada, we can think about the fact that all cicadas, annual cicadas and periodical cicadas, uh, well, annual cicadas, starting with an annual cicada, they have good and bad years. So good years are years where there's lots of cicadas and bad years are years where there's not many cicadas. And so you, you could see that this could start them off towards synchronicity because cicadas might survive better in years that have a lot of cicadas. So that individuals that emerge together have higher survival. Then you can get these natural selection feedback loops happening where you get selection for synchrony um, would require selection for a long life cycle because they have to add the waiting period on the end. So the life cycle has to be extended in order to become periodical and overcome this constraint of variable nymphal growth rates. And then after, so that would have feedback to selection for synchrony. So selection for longer life cycle and selection for synchrony would go hand in hand. And then eventually periodical cicadas develop this predator foolhardy behavior um, where they're, they're reluctant to fly. They don't fly very well. They take, for, they take um, four or five days to completely harden inside. They're very vulnerable when they first come out of the ground. And so that, be, that predator foolhardy behavior would feed back to selection for longer life cycles and selection for synchrony. And basically periodical cicadas are now trapped in their life history. If they come out in odd years, they're likely to be eaten. However, if they come out four years early in a big way, they can survive. Or if they come out four years late in a big way, they could survive too. So by coming out four um, years ahead of time, if enough of them do it, they can survive. And I think throughout time, this has happened sometimes. And those are the periodical cicadas that switched their life cycle to 13 years and eventually became permanent 13 year cicadas. And if they come out four years, uh, like if they came out one year late, they wouldn't do very well or two years late or three years late. But if they wait another four years, there would be enough individuals that have caught up so that they would be in large numbers. And so, um, we have this counting in fours hypothesis. And so one idea is that cicadas must be in the fifth instar to emerge. So they have to be fully developed. And that's that just makes sense. Um, but not as soon as they get to the fifth instar, they have, there's all these metabolic processes that have to happen during the fifth instar. So they have to be in the last fifth instar for a while, maybe four years before they can um, emerge from the ground. And some cicadas get there much, you know, way, way before others, more than four years before others. Um, and then there are these windows op of opportunity every four years. So somehow they're counting. Maybe they don't start counting till they get to the fifth stage. Um, or maybe they're counting all along, just keeping track of every year using some kind of molecular timekeeper um, until their 13 or 17 years has passed or even um, for the 13 year cicadas, maybe even just um, nine years have passed. And um, they can come out once every four years in these windows of opportunity. So we have seen 13 year cicadas come out in nine years. And with the crowdsourcing, we're seeing, seeing even more records of this. And we've seen 13 year cicadas come out after 17 years. We've seen 17 year cicadas come out in 13 years most of them in 17 years, but even um, quite a few coming out four years late after 21 years. So in the uh, part seven, 
matches K to evolution in population biology. So there's been a cooling trend since the mid Miocene. The ancestral Magus Cata lineage developed some time during the Miocene. Then the climate continued to get cooler and cooler during the Pliocene and, and by the Pleistocene 2.6 million years ago, the ice ages started and you get big fluctuations of glacial and interglacial cycles. Um, our molecular dating uh, with our Japanese colleagues suggests that the common ancestor of all extant Magus Cicada lineages um, dates back to about 4 million years. So the ancestral Ma Magus Cicada lineage, when there was just one Magus Cicada ancestor, developed sometime before this. Then at 4 million years, we get a split between the Decim group and the Cas9 and Decula ancestor. So this work was done um, with Teiji Sota and um, Jin Yoshimura and um, John Cooley, Kathy Hill, and um, the first and um, their student, uh, Satoshi Yamamoto, shown here on the right. And so this is just a summary of what we found. So um, the Magus Cicada ancestor dates back to um, the first split would be 3.9 million years ago when the Decim group split off from the ancestor of Cas9 and Decula. Then at 2.5 million years ago, the Cas9 group split from the Decula group. If we go back here to the Decim group, the, the uh, Magus Cicada trade Decim in the south, um, the southern 13 year Cicadas, they split off first. And they presumably split from a 17 year sister group. Now this 17 year sister group is here. These are the 17 year cicadas. Now, this is the new 13 year cicada, which is a, um, formed from the 17s um, right here. So that's Magus Cicada Neotradesum. And so we call this the Neosep group. And then if we go over here to the Cas9 group, we can see that, um, there was a 17 year Cassini ancestor and at some point it split from the 13 year Cassini ancestor. So um, we, we think that they were 17 years first and then the 13 year formed after and I'll show you why in a minute. And the Decula groups also split into a 13 and 17 year form. These three pairs from our genetic data, it appears that there's been a lot of recent hybridization between the 13, 17 year pairs, but not with Magus Cicada tradesum. It split off long enough ago that it doesn't hybridize with its sister group. Now, when we look at the geography of periodical cicadas, this is mostly done with mitochondrial DNA, uh, whole genomes. And so when we look at whole genomes of Decim, Cassini, and Decula group species, we see that all of them are divided into um, east, middle, and western subgroups. And the decims have this southern subgroup, which is the true 13-year decim. Cassini has an eastern, middle, and a western group, and Decula has an eastern, middle, and west, uh, western group. Now, um, the 13-year cicadas today also have Decula and Cassini living with them. But the Cass and I were not a separate old 13 year group, but instead all of the 13 year Cass and I were developed from the Western group of Cass and I that migrated in, invaded the 13 year territory and became synchronized with them. The same with Decula, except Decula invaded the Southern territory from the, from the West and from the middle. And if we look hard enough, we might find some Eastern um, decula haplotypes in with the 13 year cicadas. Now, this is not weird. All plants and animals in the Eastern United States, or almost all of them, show this same pattern where you have an Eastern group east to the Appalachians, uh, um, a, a Midwestern group west of the Appalachians, and um, another group on the Eastern edge of the Great Plains. And this is because during the ice ages, the ice moved down and um, the terminal moraine was here at Long Island and then it cut across Pennsylvania, Ohio, and um, Illinois, and different glaciers went different depths. But um, as the glaciers came down, 
they forced the forest down into the southern US into what's called glacial refuges. And in these refuges, you got northern forest trees and all of their communities, their insects and plants of those forests living down there. But after the ice retreated, then the forests moved back north and the organisms living in those forests moved north with them. And so you get these east, middle, west patterns and also some of these southern patterns. So the southern 13-year um, decim would have been living separately from an east, middle, and western refuge. And so this is what we see today. We see the 17-year um, Casni, Decula, and Decim in the red areas. We see these new 13-year Decim, and they're also accompanied by Casni and Decula um, from the west. And then down here in the south, we see 13-year cicadas with the original Magic Cicada Tray Decim, and it's now accompanied by Casni and Decula that came from the middle and western US. And so the current broods um, were created after the glaciers retreated. We know that they were created after the glaciers retreated because they're occupying areas that had ice. And so they couldn't have been there during glacial time. So these broods that, that we see today, they formed in the last 10,000 years. And some of them cross these middle and Eastern boundaries. So here we can see, for example, in gold brood five, occurs in the um, western portion and also in the eastern portion. The same is true for broods one, um, brood six, brood nine, and brood 10. Here you can see brood 10 in the east and brood 10 in the Midwest. And so there's some sort of climate events that were forming these different broods that got out of sync with each other. Um, the western broods have always been separate. So we have three four and 13, which are Western broods. Um, and they were refuging separately during the Pleistocene. So our hypothesis is that counting in fours is a consequence of this strict synchrony coupled with climate change. So coming out, what, as the climate was fluctuating during the Pleistocene, there was an advantage to being to being um, flexible in how what what year you came out, because they have to be synchronized. But they could come out after nine years. They could come after thirteen years. Out after seventeen years. And so, if the climate was warming, more of them would come out early. And if the climate was getting colder, more of them would come out late. But they'd come out in, together in synchrony. So these four-year jumps or four-year changes early or late have facilitated brood formation. They've also facilitated the invasion of new territory occupied by pre-existing periodical cicadas. So when Decula and Cass and I moved into the Tradesum territory in the south, they were able to synchronize with them by coming out four years early, four years late, and eventually coming out in the same year as them and then gaining protection from predators and doing really well in the years that they synced with the Tradesum in the south. Um, it also allows adaptation to climate change by life cycle lengthening or shortening. And so, um, so we predict that this um, life cycle shortening is gonna be happening more and more often. And perhaps even um, in the Washington DC area, you might get um, a new brood forming that would be brood six, which is in between brood 10 and two. And if you know Southern DC, uh, there's brood two in like around um, Bull Run Park and up in Baltimore area, there's also brood two. So Washington DC Baltimore is a mosaic of broods two and 10. And now it may become a mosaic of uh, 17 year broods two, six and 10. And eventually all these cicadas may permanently switch their life cycle to 13 years. So the mysteries still remaining are how do cicadas keep track of years? Um, and so they're, they're counting. So, you know, it's easy to see how they keep track of one year going by because they're feeding on roots and they know when the trees drop their leaves and when the sap starts up in the spring, but they have to count all those years. So they have to have some kind of molecular mechanism to keep track. And one of the things we're doing now is, is sequencing, getting, trying to get money to sequence their genomes so we can figure this out. We want to know what is the mechanism for the four-year jumps and the keeping track of time.
So I found this on Twitter the other day. It says, give up the superficial and unfulfilling world, follow the path of the cicada and emerge into enlightenment. So if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to enlighten you at this time. You can just type them into the chat. Chris, let me just jump in here. This is Alan. Um, first of all, to say thank you for the excellent presentation. And I just want to mention that as far as I know, this is uh, in the record attendance for a, a meeting of ESW. We had 107 participants at one point. Wow. So thank you, Chris, and thank you, Magic Cicada. <laughs> You're welcome. And so um, as, as Chris said, um, please, if you have questions, type into the type them into the chat. If you're not familiar with um, Zoom, if you move your cursor down to the bottom of your screen in the middle, there's a, a chat button and put your questions there. Um, so let me start it off, Chris. Um, I was intrigued by the, which, which called the hammerhead cicada. Uh -huh. You know, are those sexually dimorphic? Um, and do males like face off like stock-eyed flies do? Like in, in flies, that's... I think they only have a couple specimens and that they ha haven't really observed much behavior with them and can't remember um, if they have female specimens or not. So I can't tell you, it's, it's yeah, there's, I know that there's not many specimens. Okay, remains to be, to st be yeah. studied then, yeah. Or we could just, we could, you could ask Stefan Poussant, he would know. Okay. Um, so I was curious, you know, if, if new broods develop from, you know, early or, or late um, emerging ones, um, why isn't there like more geographic uh, overlap in the in the broods? Um, well, there's the there's um, a lot of mathematical modeling that's been done, and also mapping. Um, we think that if the if they overlap, they compete too much. Uh, and in fact, the only broods that we found overlapping in exactly the same woods were separated in time by at least four years. And the, um, the idea that Monty Lloyd had a long time ago is that if they're separated in time by four years, they're different enough in size that they won't compete as much. And so um, we did an experiment on Long Island where we found um, a population that had both broods one and 10. So brood, I mean, sorry, 14 and one, and brood one comes out four years after 14. And um, we had them laying eggs and branches and we had branches that had egg nests, old egg, egg nests of brood 14 and new egg nests of brood 10. And I took my ecology class out there and we did a 50 by 50 meter plot and randomly sampled and looked at the egg nest and then near next door, just adjacent, there was a plot with only brood 14 and the cicadas in the overlapping plot, there were twice as many cicadas laying eggs in the overlapping plot as in the nearby plot when it was not overlapping, it was just only brood 14. And this suggests that the forest could support twice as many cicadas when they were separated in time by four years. And, um, when broods are separated in time by one year, they're adjacent and they, they sometimes where one stops, the other starts. Although we have found a few places where there was just minor overlap along the edge between broods one and two. Um, so the idea is they're, if they're too similar in size, they compete and one outcompetes the other. The larger one outcompetes the smaller one. Okay. Um, you may have answered this. Uh, Floyd Chockley asked, given the size of the straggler emergence in 2017 of uh, brood 10 cicadas, were there enough uh, to mate and establish a new brood, you know, for a new cycle emerging in 2034? Yes. Well, we don't know for sure. We don't know for sure, but that's one of the reasons we want to try to establish baselines. And we want as many observations from citizen scientists as possible to tell us if they actually saw egg laying. And if any of you actually saw the egg laying, we would like to collect those reports from 2017. Now, the problem is <clears throat> when they come out again, 17 years later, they'll still be four years before brood 10. So we won't know if they came from um, broods, you know, from brood six, which was 
you know, a new brood establishing a brood six, or whether these are new cicadas coming out four years early from brood 10. And in fact, we would affect, we would expect both together. So four year early brood 10 could be joining the new brood six that's forming and reinforcing it. And so that's how you can get this mosaic of 10, six and two in the Washington DC area where now we just have mostly a mosaic of 10 and two, um, but now it seems like this brood six, enough of them are coming out that they might become established. Okay, uh, here's another question. Um, do all xylem sap feeders have endosymbionts? Yes, and so do um, phloem feeders because phloem is, even though it's sugar, it's also nutrient poor. And so both, um, mo like most hemipterans will have um, endosymbionts that produce their essential amino acids and vitamins, um, whether they feed on phloem or xylem, anything with a nutrient poor diet generally has endosymbionts. Okay, here's a, there's a bunch of um, comments saying what a great talk this is. I won't repeat all those. Thanks. Um, uh, here's another question though. How do periodical cicadas survive so long as nymphs? Do they have especially slow metabolisms relative to other insects? Or is it just that most insects haven't had evolutionary pressures to live for very long? Hmm. Well, um, cicadas are um, some of the, the, pretty much the only insect we know that takes longer than one year to grow up. I was talking to Chris Dietrich, who's an expert in um, other Akenarinka, especially cicadelids, and he couldn't think of any other ones that had a life cycle longer than one year, just cicadas. So um, having this life cycle longer than one year makes them really different from all other plant sucking bugs and most other insects, because you know most insects are annual or they have, they're multivolting. So they have several generations a year or two generations a year, whereas cicadas live longer than one year. Um, most of them are two years or three years, or as I said, three to five years. And so um, having this longer life cycle makes them really different. And what was the, um, what was the exact question? Um, to, uh, I don't know I, if you answered it. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I just know that um, most like longer living organisms have slower metabolisms. Would, ah, would right. is that like looked yeah. into? Like, is that how is that compared to other insects? Yeah, I, I we actually haven't done uh, metabolic measurements on the periodic cicadas, but right. they do. They are relatively slow growing, um, and um, but you know this partly is because of natural selection for lengthening their life cycle. <clears throat> but, you know, um, so like if you look at Arctic woolly bear caterpillars, um, in the southern part of their distribution, they grow faster. And in the northern part of their distribution, they just have much longer, well, much shorter growing seasons. So they, they, they actually freeze, then they come unfrozen, and then they grow, and they grow for as long as they can, and then they, they you know, go back into dormancy again by freezing. And so... Um, and you see the same things where, where a lepidopteran might go up a mountain and in, in la, um, going up in altitude and at the bottom of the mountain, it might have a one-year life cycle and at the top of the mountain, a two-year life cycle. So that's related to how long they have to grow, the length of the growing season. Um, but those go into dormancy, right? But periodical cicadas don't have dormancy. They're just growing the whole time. Well, they're probably growing slower in the winter because there's not too much to feed on, but um, still they're just, you know, they don't have any set dormancy periods. Um, and then, you know, there's other insects like yucca moths that can go dormant for like 20 years. And then, and also some beetles that have been found like cerambicids in the hammer, in the handles of hammers that are imported into the United States and furniture that have come out like 50 years after the furniture oh. was imported, wow. uh, things like that. So they can go dormant in a really dry situations for a long period of time. Oh, okay. so they're not just, do, they're not doing anything crazy. It's just the, the evolutionary pressures have made them so that they live like longer. Okay. Thanks. I think so. But, you know, if right. you want to study their know. metabolism, that would yeah. be interesting. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great talk, too. <laughs> uh, here's another question. Does Magis Cicada use citizen science data from other apps like iNaturalist? 
Oh, yeah. Well, Cicada Safari is sharing data with iNaturalist. And um, yes, and so they're importing the data and um, they're going to plot that on their maps. Yeah, good question. Uh, here's another question. Um, Chris, what would you see in the genome to indicate a counting mechanism? Would it be an epigenetic phenomenon instead? Yeah, we think that. Um, so um, Teji Soda's group has already done um, transcriptome sequencing for um, all the seven species of periodical cicadas, and they have not found any genetic difference that is shared by all 13s versus all 17s. <clears throat> so it doesn't seem to be um, a genetic difference. We think it's a regulatory difference, an uh, epigenetic dis difference between the two. So in our grant proposal, we're proposing to do um, genome sequencing, including looking at methylation and also histone modifications to see if that might be the control for the, um, the life cycle. Oh, and people are doing this with bamboos in China. So, you know, there's some bamboos that flower once every 50 years or once every 100 years. And um, there they've found that there's a slow accumulation of methylation over the lifetime of the bamboo. And then also that some long RNA molecules might be involved um, in keeping track of the years. And so we think it might be a similar mechanism in periodical cicadas. Hmm. Um, has any research been done to determine if cicada nymphs can communicate while underground? <laughs> that question um, kind of made me think about like there's news stories coming out about how trees communicate. Yeah, yeah. Um, we get that question a lot. We don't have any evidence that there's communication underground. Um, they're all feeding on the same trees, so they're getting the same cues from the trees. Um, but uh, we don't, you know, right now we don't have any evidence for that. It would be an interesting thing to try to figure out. But one really um, interesting thing is that one of the bacterial endosymbionts that lives in the cicadas is actually derived from a rhizobium bacteria. So the rhizobiales, and that's the lineage that um, root nodules, um, those bacteria are rhizobiales. Rhizobiale so they might have gotten those bacteria from the roots. Um, here's another one. Great talk. Would you please talk a bit about the simple, mecha simple mechanics of cicadas feeding on roots, how deep they are, how long it takes them to emerge once they detach from the roots? How is it that they synchronize their emergence? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, they're feeding with their rostrum stuck right into xylem tubes, and this was shown by Joanne White, who did some really tedious root sectioning. Um, and um, they, they, so they're sitting underground about, you know, they vary in depth um, from eight to 12 inches underground, but they have been found quite deep according to Marlat in the 1800s, um, just in, by accident in excavations they've been found. But generally, you know, the roots don't go that deep. So they're mostly in the root zone. Um, and the little tiny nymphs can be found often in, on grass roots in, in the first year and then go deeper. And so as they get bigger, they feed on bigger roots on that rootlet. And when they're little, they feed on little rootlets. Um, and so they, but um, the, re, the, the timing for the day that they come out is the ground temperature. And Jim Heath did a lot of research on that and showed that um, he looked at environments where you had a sunny hillside and then a valley and then a shady hillside. And he showed that as the ground temperature reached 64 in this, this one place, but on the sunny hillside, they came out first because the ground temperature reached 64 first. And then the shady hillside, they came out a little bit later. And so that's why even in, you know, even around your own yard, you might find shady areas, they come out a little bit later than sunny areas. And there's also evidence that Cas9 comes out a little bit later than Decim. Um, so all of these kinds of observations are really useful. I'm already seeing like holes starting to appear in my yard. So I, I guess they they open the, the hole all the way up and then they go back down until yep. the temperature. Yep. They sit in there. They sit in there for like a month ahead of time. Okay. 
Um, are there any particular microbes associated across all genera and or species? Are there differences in the microbiome of different genera and species? So the, um, the cicadas all have these specialized um, bacteria. They all have, um, they all have the genus Celsia as one. There's two co-primary endosymbionts. One is Celsia makes eight essential amino acids and the other is Hodgkinia that comes from Rhizobium, Rhizobialis. And it makes two essential amino acids plus all of the B vitamins. Um, all cicadas have these. In fact, all plant sucking bugs have um, the Celsia, but only cicadas have the Hodgkinia. And occasionally the, the Hodgkinia is replaced by a fungal symbiont um, that's derived from a parasite called opiocordyceps that normally kills the nymphs, but um, some of the fungi have uh, been tamed by the cicadas so that they stay in a yeast-like form and they never form hyphae, they never kill the nymphs, and they, they take the place of the Hodgkinia. And my postdoc, Eric Gordon has found that this has happened at least 17 times throughout the world in different cicadas. But of course, we haven't looked at all 3,000 species, so probably a lot more times. Hmm. Um, so Mike Graup uh, asks, should we expect to see a northern range expansion with climate change? And he also says, in 2017, we saw Cassini chorusing strongly in Columbia. They laid eggs and the eggs hatched. Columbia, Missouri, or uh, Columbia, Maryland? Maryland. <laughs> you're, you're muted. Oh. No, can, you're can still you hear me muted. now? Um, you you're still me? muted. No. About there. now. Okay, yeah, now. <laughs> Great talk, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Yeah, here in Columbia, Maryland, there was a really strong, a uh, pretty weak septendecim chorus, but the Cassinis were just rocking it. So, in 2017. Yeah, she's muted. Yeah, in 2017. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And, and laying eggs. Oh yeah, the eggs hatched. Oh good, great, great. That's good to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How about the range expansion northward? Okay, so um. They could. Um, the problem is that on it, it depends on, they, they can only move like with the advancing edge of a forest. So they could eat this very slowly. So it took them 10,000 years to get, you know, up to um, Connecticut or Massachusetts from their Southern refuges. But um, right now, you know, the nor on the northern edge, they've sort of been knocked back because of clearing for agriculture during the 1800s. And so they were knocked back so much that brood 11 in Connecticut and Massachusetts and Rhode Island went extinct in the 1950s. And just because they were just so few individuals and um, upstate New York brood seven has decreased over the last like five generations. Um, and they used to be in, in, I think about seven counties and now they're in one county just on the Onondaga Indian Reservation around Syracuse. So the Northern Edge is not doing that well right now. And you know, they also disappeared from Southern Wisconsin, um, but they could conceivably start moving North again with the forest. If the forest moves you know, from a place where there's cicadas, and they can move along the edge to a new suburban lot or to a, a nice orchard or, you know, just keep moving that way, but it would be very slowly. And human development might get in the way. As, as farms here in Maryland are going back to residential neighborhoods, parks and things like that, I, I kind of have the feeling that it's getting better for cicadas here. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Because they have edges, they can move from the edge into the new part to the new suburbs. They like suburbs because they have fertilized lawns and they're sunnier and. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, Floyd Shockley also said he saw 2017 uh, stragglers laying eggs in Northern Virginia. Great. Um, he said, I still have vouchers in the freezers. Great. So any interest. Um, I just wanna mention there's like 25 more uh, messages uh, I'm happy to continue. I think this is fascinating, but if you have other commitments and, and need to cut things off, let us know. 
-hmm. Well, um, yeah, I could keep answering some questions as long as people want to hang around. Okay, great. Um, can cicadas hasten the death of oak trees during prolonged droughts? Is there evidence to support that? Lots of oaks have been dying off for mysterious uh, multiple causes. Oh yeah, our forests aren't doing that well up here either. Um, and we don't have periodical cicadas in our forest, but um, the, um, there is evidence from orchards um, that there's a, sort of a decline in fruit productivity in the last four years um, when the cicadas are getting really big and they're sort of putting a drain on, the, or on apple trees. Um, these are from the 1930s. And um, then um, right after the emergence, when the cicadas first um, come out and then they die, they fertilize the trees and there's holes in the ground that aerate the ground and then the trees grow really well and you get this bumper crop. So there is evidence that there's some um, effect. And then there's been some tree ring studies where you can see the effect of the cicadas on the trees. And then after the first and second instars really get going, they, they, you know, there might be a little um, uh, drop in productivity and then, but then it's not really a big drain on the tree until they get to like the larger instar, the last instar. Um, hey, I remember you mentioned earlier, uh, we were talking before the meeting that like a lot of times small trees are, are badly damaged and so yeah. this would not be a good spring around here to plant a new yeah. tree in your no, yard. You don't if you're in a periodical cicada area you shouldn't plant new trees and if the tree is small enough to put netting over you should put netting over it but if it's large enough to you know that you can't even get netting over it it'll probably be okay um, but they can kill small trees because they do like to fly down onto fast growing trees. Um, and so they can kill those. Um, Kathleen asks, what's so special about the three locations that there are periodical cicadas, the US, India, and Fiji? Well, you got oh, you're muted. muted. Okay, so we don't know how they get started, but in Southeast Asia, there's a lot of cicadas that are called gregarious. And so um, they're, when they come out, they come out in big groups and they tend to cluster for singing and things like that. Um, and so from these gregarious cicadas, if they have good and bad years, they might've just developed this periodicity the same way uh, in, as in the United States. But yeah, I, have, I don't know the, Pleistocene history of that area. So I don't know how they might have extended their life cycle, but there's so many other cicadas there. I guess they just happened into it and then got stuck that, there. And in Fiji, the periodical cicada in Fiji has a relative, a, sist a sister genus in Fiji that's not periodical. So one of them became periodical, the other didn't. So I think they just happened into it because of some kind of historical accident and then they get stuck there. Sorry, I accidentally muted, muted you earlier instead of myself. <laughs> That's okay. Um, uh, another question from Ben Smith. Do we expect to see the loss of ash trees to have an impact on emergence? Are the cicadas able to switch hosts if the host trees die? Um, I think they can if the roots are, well, if the roots, especially if the roots are meshed underground from all different trees. But I did do this interesting um, experiment accidentally where um, in, um, we went to Washington DC uh, during the 2017 emergence and it was after the emergence was over and we dug in this plot that had these, um, emergence holes and we in a fifth a one meter square plot we encountered 15 emergence holes and then we dug down uh, about eight inches underground and we found twice as many cicadas still underground that were going to be coming out um, later for brood 10. Um, but then 
uh, two years later, we went back and dug another plot right next door to the plot we had done dug in 2019. And when we dug up those nymphs, they were half of them were dead. They were just empty nymph shells, shell, shells. And so I take that to mean that we cut a bunch of roots when we were digging up the first plot. And when we cut those roots, we must have uh, um, cut off the cicadas that were right next to them in the adjacent plot, because I've dug lots of other plots in many places and I've never seen this before, but it was fully half, exactly half of the, the fifth and star nymphs were dead. So that means they didn't move over just, you know, a few feet to try to find another tree. So I was really surprised. I mean, we know that they don't move very much, but, but I thought that if their root was cut, that they would you know, move away and try to find another route. So apparently a bunch of them didn't, like half of them didn't move away and the other half were alive. So, um, so yeah, I don't, I mean, they can, when they're smaller, obviously they must move because they switch and they're more active and they switch from little roots to bigger roots. But apparently when they get to be in the fifth instar, they don't, they can't even go and find themselves a new route. It's just, I was really surprised by that. Okay, um, Teddy asks, have any naturally occurring pathogens been seen in cicadas? I'm thinking about BT and silkworms. Could the presence of a pathogen affect the timing of emergence? Yeah, um, we haven't found any um, uh, other than the fungus. Um, I mean, there's also a fungus that attacks the adults, Massospora, and um, they pick it up. They pick up the spores as they come out of the ground, and then they um, then it um, actually changes their behavior and uh, eventually kills them. But before it kills them, their behaviors change so that males start acting like females. Um, they call in other males and they transfer the fungus to them. The fungus goes through two spore stages, and so in this. Second spore stage, the cicadas fly around with it and they drop the spores everywhere. And then the spores stay in the ground for 13 or 17 years till new cicadas come out and pick up new spores. Um, so that's a pathogen that they get. And there must, there must be others. We have not found Wolbachia bacteria in cicadas, magis cicada. It's uh, other cicadas, but not in magis cicada um, that, so far. Um, so yeah, so I don't know what other pathogens might be uh, attacking those. But they, um, you know, there's a lot of mites that live in the egg nests. And you know, if you look in Marlat, he lists a whole bunch of parasites that attack cicadas. Hmm. Is, that, is that true? Are there parasites of the um, magis cicada too? Like do they hit other cicadas in between or something? Yeah, um, Marlet lists a whole bunch of like parasitic mites and uh, there's a parasitic wasp. Um, and we see, we also see on New Zealand cicadas, mites and wasps, tiny little parasitic wasps that lay eggs in the cicada eggs and um, various other kinds of, um, well, lots of different mites, but, um, I haven't really studied them, but I just know that Marlet lists a whole bunch of associates of Magis cicada in his 1907 uh, monograph, which was reprinted in 1923. Okay, Matt Blaine asks, even though they're generalist feeders, are there any trees they don't feed on? Um, well, they don't seem to like pines very much. Um, and then also in terms of egg laying, they don't lay eggs in pines. They, they avoid cherry because of all the resin in the cherry and um, in pines as well. They don't seem to lay eggs in Osage orange according to Joanne White, because it's got very hard wood. Um, and so, but otherwise they're more or less generalists. Sorry, I went the wrong way in the messages here. Um, <laughs> Nate Irwin asked, why raptorial forelegs for digging? Yeah, that's for the digging. Yeah, they have they have like little mole legs and the, they have a femoral comb, which I think assists in the digging. It gets bigger as they get older. 
Yeah, so they're not really raptorial, they're more like digging. Okay, and Don Weber says, um, there's also a positive effect nutrient pulse that has been demonstrated in forest ecosystems. Mm -hmm. um, so, do, uh, so do they use the dead brood 10? Oh, we said, so use the dead brood 10 in your garden, great natural fertilizer. Yeah, yeah, that work was done by Louis Yang and Rick Carvin at UC Davis. Um, and they saw a strong effect of the fertilizer of dead bodies of cicadas. He says, never put them in the trash, teach your neighbors too. <laughs> yeah, they do get a bit smelly sometimes though. Um, here's a question from Elizabeth, Elizabeth please. Um, what will be the impact of the brood 10 emergence on other animals such as birds? Ah, so um, that's been studied as well. Um, by a number of different people. And um, birds seem to produce larger um, clutches in years that have cicadas, because there's uh, lots more food around. Um, and the, But the effect doesn't seem to last more than a couple of years after the emergence. Oh, and there was some recent work um, by uh, Sandy Liebhold and um, Walt Koenig on birds, um, just looking at a statistical effect of increase of birds in areas with cicadas. Okay, Art Evans asks, do you find nymphs parasitized by beetle larvae? I haven't, um, but I would look in Marlat to see, I mean, he's got a pretty comprehensive list of insects associated with magic cicada. Okay, and, and Jamie was saying we, we probably need to cut things off now. There's still 38 more messages. To, to <laughs> that's okay. So, um, yeah, Chris, well, this was, this was terrific. It's so, uh, so many um, inter interesting areas for exploring. It's amazing. Yeah, they imagine Cicada always get lots of questions. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we can turn it back over to Jamie then. Okay, thanks. Yeah, great talk, Chris. Thank you so much. Obviously, is there, there's a lot of interest. I wish we could get to it all, but uh, I think we, we should probably uh, get wrapping it up. Um, let's give a virtual applause to Chris and thank you so much. It's great. <laughs> Thanks. It's a re really great turnout for us. Uh, so it's, it's, it's great to see so many people out there and um, people excited about cicadas. Good. Hopefully um, you'll get new members. <laughs> yeah, excellent. That would be great. Um, so thank you everybody thank you chris um do we have a motion to adjourn the meeting would anybody so like to motion motion <laughs> motion to adjourn the meeting a second 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 the meeting is adjourned bye everybody thank you everybody bye. and uh you might want to remind everybody jamie that um the um, the meeting is recorded, so it's on um, on YouTube. So if you want to refer um, people to that, that's right. Um, you missed out. It'll be posted on our YouTube channel, which uh, I posted a link all the way at the top of the chat. Um, I can post it again in the chat here um, in just a minute. So yeah, um, I think the one question we get is when are they coming out. Is it May? Is it April? Uh, it's generally mid-May, but you have to um, monitor the temperatures. And Dan Bruner's class is monitoring the temperatures. And uh, yeah, so they you can just ask them. Well, I'll be I'll be following them. But you know, because some springs are warmer than others, so you know, look at how your plants are doing in your yard, and if the if the flowers are flowering at the same time or early or late. So they could be within, you know, one week early, one week late, two weeks early, two weeks late. You never know. It depends on the spring. Wonderful. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. It was thanks everybody. Yeah. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thanks for Good night.